Thank you everyone for being here tonight. My name is Allison Campbell, Campbell and I'm a college planning consultant here at Estrella Consulting. I want to welcome three amazing um, presenters that are here today, just helping us with applying to the arts. So our goal tonight is to give you kind of a 30,000 foot view of what to expect when you are getting ready to apply to the arts. We have a representative from a film program, um, music conservatory, and a visual arts school. So you'll hear a little bit about each one in more depth. Um, and like I said, we're going to have um, some time at the end for you to ask some questions. So if you have questions, feel free to drop it into the Q&A. And um, the chat will probably not be monitored since it's just me tonight. So Q&A if you can, and then we'll save some time at the end to answer specific questions. So I'm very excited to welcome Priscilla Campos from Chapman University, and she's representing the Dodge College of Film and Media, Josh Teaster from Oberlin College and Conservatory in Oberlin, Ohio, and Eric Castor from the College of Creative Studies in Detroit, Michigan. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that Chapman University is in Orange, California. So we are literally spanning the U.S. right now. So our agenda for tonight, like I had um, just mentioned some introductions, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves in some more depth later on in the presentation. But we're going to talk a little bit, um, just a high-level overview of programs. So as you're discerning whether the arts are for you, we'll talk about um, different opportunities at different types of colleges and universities or school-specific, um, and then also the types of degrees some best practices. So as you are a student or maybe a family that is looking um, to pursue the arts after high school graduation, um, what are some things that you need to start doing now? So giving yourself enough time, um, how the application process works, just some things to consider that may be a little bit different from a traditional application. And then we will break it out and talk with Priscilla in depth about um, the film program. We'll talk to Josh about music at the conservatory at Oberlin. And then we'll talk with Eric about art and design at the College of Creative Studies. All right, so we're going to start here with just some types of art programs and degrees. So we'll start with a Bachelor of Arts, and you'll find this more at usually a uh, traditional university. So if you're someone who really enjoys art, maybe it's a hobby, maybe it's something that you're really good at, um, but it might not be something that you're going to pursue as a career. Um, you don't see, um, you know, you might be doing something like commission, commissioned here and there, but it's not going to be, again, something that you're pursuing beyond uh, like just like a hobby or an artistic passion. When you're at the school and you're pursuing a Bachelor of Arts, you'll find that a lot of the classes you're going to take are still going to be in like a liberal arts core. So you'll um, perhaps have a dual major that you'll study business because you plan on taking over the family business, but you could do a degree with a Bachelor of Arts because you really enjoy painting or um, you really love film studies or something like that. You'll have an ability to take classes outside, outside of the arts focus. Um, and then you'll just have, once you declare um, whatever program that you're looking for within a Bachelor of Arts, the required number of classes for that specific art form. So there is a little bit more flexibility. Um, you're not really like tied into that hardcore, but I mean, it will definitely be taken seriously. It just won't be your life. You'll have an opportunity if you want to explore maybe Greek life or athletics or things outside of that. Um, but arts, you know, can still be a, a large piece of your identity. Then we have a BFA, so Bachelor of Fine Arts, and the majority of your classes are going to come in that specific art form. It will definitely be a more intensive focus, and you know your end goal will obviously be pursuing something in that fine art after graduation. Um, and the limited of you'll have a limited number of additional courses beyond what you're studying in that BFA. So um, maybe there will be like a business element or an HR element or you know a foreign language or something um, that the college might outline, but you're going to be very, very focused on um, that arts, that particular arts course and that degree. And then bachelors of music. So very, very similar. Um, it's usually, you know, it'll be obviously hyper-focused with music, but you might have a specific focus within music um, because it is very diverse as many of the arts programs are, but you can choose to study performance, you can do composition, maybe music education, music theory, music therapy, and that's just to name a few. So you can get very granular and specific within that music degree. 
Um, so types of art schools are like some how art programs kind of represent themselves at art schools. So we have a traditional liberal arts or research university with an arts program. So um, would it be fair to say that Chapman is something that has would be a good representation of this? So a student is still going to receive a core education. Um, there is some more flexibility with their academics. So they might be able to double major. They might be able to um, major in something and then minor in an art. Um, there, again, is some flexibility socially to pursue different things. Um, and then different level of intensity. So again, like knowing, is this something that I'm just really good at? I have a hobby. It's always been a part of my identity and I can pursue this alongside something else versus moving kind of closer, like into the middle of our screen um, when we're at like a college of the conservatory or a college of the arts where it's my burning passion, desire. This is what I'm destined to do. I'm going to make this my livelihood. Um, so when we're at a college with a conservatory, and I actually used to work at Baldwin Wallace, so have a little bit of background with um, the conservatory and how that works, but having a majority of classes in a specific art form, again, that intensive focus, the, you know, the kids that are in a conservatory, and I know I, I went to Oberlin actually a few months ago, and they loved, the Oberlin students that I spoke to loved the fact that they could have a dual degree. And, you know, they really could pursue thing to academic passions or you know, like their academic passion and their music passion equally. They didn't feel like they had to choose. Um, so that potential to do a dual degree program was really amazing because I, I do feel like a lot of kids that are musically inclined are very intelligent. I think that there's a lot of crossover too with like being able to like read music and count time and stuff like that. And, you know, they were, there was a lot of math majors, a lot of science majors. So that was really interesting to me. Um, and then a college or school for the arts. So obviously very hyper-focused, like this is their passion. Um, they know that this is the end result in whatever capacity that it will be. Um, you have an opportunity to take very niche art curriculum or classes. Um, there is a lot of like mentorship opportunity. So the ability to work one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups with professors or faculty that are, you know, the experts in their craft. Um, there's a very limited, there are limited courses outside of the arts discipline. Like it'll probably be, you know, 90 to 95% arts focused. Um, and like I had said already, a small, a smaller ration or sorry, I was covering my thing. Smaller ratio, sorry. Um, and more intensive men mentorship at a college for the arts. All right, so some best practices. Hopefully, if you're watching this, um, you are maybe a freshman, sophomore, possibly a junior, um, or a parents of a freshman, sophomore, or junior. If you're a junior, like, thank goodness you're here because we, we definitely need to get cracking on some of these things. But as you start to research, like, is this for me? Is an arts program or an arts degree, is this for me? like finding out like what fits your personality. So this is just for a college in general. If you're someone who needs to be closer to home, do you want a larger environment? Do you want somewhere like University of Michigan where you want the football and the, and the rah rah and like, you know, the opportunity to do Greek life or do you want something that is, you know, in New York City or, you know, whatever it is that feels more at home to you? make sure that we're we're tailoring our list to, to those preferences as well. Um, what fits your learning style? Again, and, and again, this could go back to all academics. Are you someone who is okay to be in a large lecture hall and be one of a hundred students versus do you really need that, you know, one to five or one-on-one -on -one mentorship or um, lessons? You know, what is what is it that you're craving or that you're seeking through your education? Um, and then what fits your end goal? Again, is this, is whatever artistic field or passion that you're pursuing, is this a hobby? Do you just really love, you know, making Vimeos with your friends or, um, you know, you're in a band in your garage or, you know, you really love to sing a cappella with your school choir, or is this like the goal is to be in an opera or, you know, to be commissioned to do sculptures, you know, whatever it is, like needing to know if this is my end goal, what's going to be the best path for me um, as far as college fit. So building your portfolio, and I am definitely looking forward to what you have to say about this because I 
had a student last year who kind of out of the blue was like, I'm going to go into film. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, tell me more about that. And I was a newer IEC. So I was intrigued about it. Um, and he basically told me he really liked the Godfather and he loved like casino. I mean, a lot of like the Martin Scorsese films and whatnot, but I was like, so you have a portfolio, we you know, what have you been doing? He's like, not really, you know, and I'm backtracking a little bit like, okay, I need to investigate like what goes into a good portfolio? What are type, some of the types of programs or, or platforms that my students should be using if they're trying to do this? And granted, it's it was late in the game. He changed to finance major. It was fine. Um, but again, running through some of these would have been helpful for him to say like, What's my, do I, am I passionate about filmmaking or do I just really like to watch films and analyze it and have an eye for that? Because that's cool, but maybe we're going to do film studies minor versus applying. I mean, he was ready to apply to USC and I was like, let's reel that back in. Um, so building your portfolio, because that was something he probably would have had to do and have done it much earlier. Um, how does your portfolio show your skills? How does it show the diversity maybe across like mediums and maybe through the projects that you've done? Um, showing your arc, your artistic style through your portfolio. So is there like a theme to the type of work that you do? Do you feel like your work can show kind of like who you are and what you're passionate about? Um, sort of like how an essay works for um, the Common App, the personal statement are you able to do that through your portfolio? And then making sure when you are building your portfolio, we're using high level photography with good lighting, maybe asking a mentor or a teacher to help you with it. You're not snapping them on your iPhone using your uh, your comforter as your background or you know a beach towel or whatever. So making sure that we're really taking a professional stance on how we're submitting some of these materials and creating that portfolio. Um, the ability to have your portfolio reviewed, um, if you have, if you would like, I'm going to actually have this linked to the presentation if you registered, um, but it's a link to the National Portfolio Day. So I'd love to get your feedback on that. Like what are ways that you are able to get your portfolio reviewed? So whether it's through an art teacher or a professor or someone in the community that is an art professional through National Portfolio Day, getting some eyes on it and being able to take feedback. And I know as an artist, that's very critical is the ability to take feedback, um, whether it's just, you know, I think you're, you know, you could take better pictures or this, or you could structure how you're assembling your portfolio or just giving feedback on the actual work, um, being open to that. And then uh, the second to last bullet point is attention to details. And you're going to find as you're pursuing an arts degree, that you're kind of running parallel to applying to being a traditional applicant, there are many more deadlines. There are many more things that you need to be paying attention to, um, you need to be reading, and you need to be starting much earlier. You know, I find, um, you know, where I where I live, a lot of students are starting this, like this discernment process, like the end of their junior year, that summer between junior and senior year. But if this is something you're serious about, this needs to be starting a year or more in advance because again you're you're kind of creating that body of work you you know need to figure out is what type of school is going to be for you what are the deadlines that they um, require do they require an audition um, just being more mindful of those things and giving yourself plenty of time like I just said being very very detail oriented um, being very organized whether you're working with us and you know we find that we're making spreadsheets or using your uh, your platform that um, we have for all of our clients to keep everything in order. We are on top of that right alongside of you. But if you're joining us and you're not an Estrella client, like what ways are you keeping all of your dates organized and keeping all of your ducks in a row? All right, so a few other things to consider. So the selectivity of a program, can anybody join this arts program? Can anybody declare to be in this major, or does it require an audition? Do they only take 12? So again, when I worked at Baldwin Wallace, music theater was the big program and it was nationally renowned, um, but we only took 12 on average a year. And, you know, we had audition days and pre-screens and things like that. So again, 
with maybe the passion that you might have for that might determine the selectivity of where you might want to go. Giving yourself a lot of runway. Um, are you going to need art letters of recommendation? So um, utilizing the people that you work with at school, if you're taking, if you have opportunities in the community, or if you're maybe getting like private lessons from somewhere, just who can you utilize maybe that has some connections and can really speak to your talents. Um, and I've mentioned this multiple times, but again, evaluating, do you have a constant burning need to pursue your craft? Um, I've talked in depth with Amber, who many of you know, Amber is one of our other consultants here at Estrella and her husband is a high school arts teacher, but also a very incredible, amazing artist. And he says like, this is the number one determinant for me when I'm talking to kids that are, you know, starting this process. I'm like, do you have a burning passion desire to do nothing but art? Because it's so, it can be so engulfing. I mean, you, you have to like live it, breathe it, think about it nonstop, know that this is going to be your life's work because that's how the next four years are going to be if that's how you feel about it. Um, so hopefully... Those are things that you'll you'll think about as you're kind of going down this path. All right, I'm ready to pass it off. So um, if you have any questions, again, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A and then we'll round them up all at the end. But I'm so excited to welcome Priscilla Campos from Chapman University, again, in Orange, California. And she's from the Dodge College and she's their director of admissions. So um, Priscilla, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you for joining us from uh, Pacific Time. I appreciate yes. it. Thank you so much for having me. That was a great presentation. It's actually a lot of the tips that we give too. So that was a perfect intro. <laughs> okay, good. I feel like I'm kind of a newbie to this. Again, I, I was out of out of the, the film degree or the film um, program being dropped on me last year, kind of out of nowhere. It really forced me to do my own research and... Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm ready to hear from the experts though. So um, can you just give us a quick background about the Dodge College and about a little bit about Chapman? So for those of the people that are on here that don't know about it, they can get kind of a quick overview. Absolutely. So we're a mid-sized liberal arts college in Orange County. So in Orange is about 30, 50 minutes with traffic from LA. So we're not far from LA. We're very close to the industry. Um, it's a small town in Orange. We're about 10 minutes from Disneyland. So prime area. Um, we are mid-sized. So our film school specifically is about 1,500 students. That's 1,200 undergraduates and about 300 graduate students. Um, I love that you talked a little bit about the difference. So in our undergrad, um, you have the chance you're also getting a liberal arts degree while you are studying film or any of our programs. But our graduate programs are more of a conservatory. So exactly, you know, specifying on what you came to study. Um, but I love that you explained that because not a lot of people know the difference. Um, some unique things about our program. So I wanted to point out three things that make us a little bit special or different from our other programs. Um, obviously, we're the number four film school in the country, which has been fantastic, but that is all due to our community here. We have a fantastic community of students. Everybody's super collaborative. Everybody wants to be on set, help everybody. Um, I'm an athlete uh, in my previous life or in nature, so I'm super competitive. Um, but I tell people that is not the community we have here. So the industry in general is very competitive, and we know when once you, you know, go into the industry and what you want to study, um, you will be fighting for those jobs and those projects. Um, but that's not the community that we fostered here in our undergraduate degree. So everybody's super collaborative. They want to work on projects together. They're very helpful. Um, so that's one of the things that I love about here. Um, also is the opportunity to get on set. So last weekend alone, we had 37 student productions on set on one weekend. So there are plenty of opportunities for students to get hands-on work. Um, you do not have to be in one of the majors to volunteer on set um, and you do not have to be an upperclassman to volunteer on set so freshman weekend one if you've met someone that is shooting that weekend you are more than welcome to you know get your foot in the door and start getting hands-on experience um, so that's another unique feature and then the last unique feature that I think is su super special about this place is that Chapman or Dodge College does not own any rights to anything that you make here so your funding however you funded your project or if you use any of your equipment or any of our sound stages or anything um, um, you still own the rights to all of your work. So if you graduate here and you put together a project, which is what the Duffer Brothers did with Stranger Things, um, you're welcome to sell that to Netflix. So we will help you with the guidance and we will cheer you on the whole way. Um, but we do not any own rights to the project. That is all up to the creators of the of the work. And that obviously goes back to the students. So 
That's awesome. That is really cool. I was doing a little bit of digging on the website and I was just looking at some of the people that you brought on to campus, which is really incredible. And I'm sure, you know, it's an easy sell as far as just your proximity to LA and the industry and just having those at your fingertips. So thank you for sharing some of your unique tips. Um, my next question for you, um, and actually everybody's going to get all these same questions, is what which qualities are the admission team looking for in an applicant specific to your program? Yeah. So we're looking for storytellers and collaborators. So I know you gave an example of like, is this a passion? Did you just pick this up? We have a mixture of both, which is what I love. Some students, you know, picked up a camera when they were three years old. Do they love, they shoot, they eat, breathe, live, die, film. That's their thing. They love it. But we also have a ton of students who are like, I kind of did this. I'm not sure, but I'm just passionate about telling stories. Um, and so we have a unique mix about both. So we love people like, again, want to come on campus and collaborate with others. Um, a ton of our students would not be a good fit if they were like, I sit in my room and I shoot it and edit it all by myself. And this is my project. Um, so we love people that want to put themselves out there that willing to be vulnerable. Like you said, get feedback from other people um, and really just throw themselves out there. So that's one thing we look for. We also look for people to be able to tell a story visually so there's lots of cool apps out there right now. So you're, you know, editing apps, AI, ton of new technology coming out, and that's fantastic. But it all comes down to storytelling. Do you love telling stories? What kind of stories do you love to tell? Um, and why do you want to come here and tell them? And then the last thing is your emphasis. So starting to think about what you like to do. Do you like directing? Do you like editing? Do you want to be a producer? Do you want to be a writer? You don't necessarily need to know now. We know you're, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, still thinking about what it is. Uh, but just having an idea to figure out where you would fit in on our campus and how you would be able, be able to collaborate with others, um, I think it's important. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, at what point do you feel that people should start looking into Chapman and, um, you know, getting their materials together or starting the, the application process? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of film schools will just ask you to submit projects that you've worked on on your own. So if you love doing that on the side with your friends, you can start working on that way ahead of time. We specifically pick a prompt that is a two minute film um, about a character making a decision using no dialogue. So again, strictly storytelling, strictly visual. What do you want to tell me? Now we have students who have shot something on an iPhone. So we're not worried so much about the technical part. We can teach you all of that. We have the top of the line technology here. We have eight sound stages that we will teach you. Again, it's focusing on your storytelling and really showing us who you are and your passion in your film, I think is super important. So getting to know the deadlines. And I know you mentioned that earlier, but being organized, we get a ton of people who submit materials and it'll say like, application to USC. And we're like, great, we're Chapman. But <laughs> so yeah. be mindful of what you're putting together. I think is super important. We know you're applying to all the top schools. I'm sure all of us on this panel understand that and we're okay with that. But we do we do want to make sure that you're taking time, you know, to put in the little bit of effort to show why you're interested in us. So making sure that you're reading clearly what we're asking of you, not submitting anything more or under than when we're asking you. Um, I know on our side of the page, it's a lot of time and effort and hours that we spend on reading applications. So making sure that people are following deadlines is important too. I appreciate what you said about with that two minute video that a student can shoot it on their iPhone because yeah. I think it's definitely an equalizer as far as accessibility. And some students may not have the brand new camera or a studio at their school to, ha to have the access to those types of things. So allowing people to use what they have and you know, using their creativity and their storytelling to be, you know, the, the determinant is really a, a great idea. So I appreciate that. Um, and then the last thing would be, what is one thing that you wish every student interested in the field um, that you are representing knew before starting this process? I think one thing that I always try to remind students is to have fun, to experiment, to try to show your passion and your unique, your unique way of telling a story. The application reviewers and the faculty should remember you by your passion, your audacity, your commitment to the art or to the your, your craft. Um, but the most memorable applicants that we've always gone is because their passion clearly shows through the film. So yes, we have people submit stuff that like, again, you know, have a film program at their school. They've been shooting for a long Long time clearly they're very talented but a ton of students that we admitted had just shown their passion through their video again 
two minute film, shot it on their iPhone. I'm like, that is a fantastic story. We would we love to have you on campus. You would be great stories. Um, so have fun. We know this is a super stressful process. We know this is a busy time for everyone when they're applying. But if I could go back and tell everybody something that they should know is to remember to enjoy that you're putting these pieces together um, and try to find those things that re remind you on why you're applying for this you know, major or area or industry. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so if you want to get in touch with Priscilla, if you have specific questions, I have put her email at the bottom of the slide and we'll make sure to share it when we get this out, this recording out to everybody. So thank you so much. Yeah. So we're moving back to East Coast time. Um, actually, my fellow Lorain County neighbor is Josh Teaster, who is the Director of Conservatory Admissions and Enrollment Management at Oberlin College and Conservatory. So welcome, Josh. Yeah, thanks so much. Good evening, everyone. So just like I asked with Priscilla, can you give us a little bit of overview on Oberlin College and Conservatory and maybe three things that you feel like make your program unique? Sure. Yeah. So um, as Allison mentioned, we're located Northeast Ohio, about 40 minutes outside of Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland's the nearest major city center, but we're outside of the city on a college campus. So uh, the conservatory here is about 550 to 600 students. So in terms of the top tier conservatory schools of music, we're kind of medium, medium, large size, um, which is kind of funny hearing Priscilla talk about Chapman and the medium size being in the thousands. You know, 550 is kind of big for us as a music school. Uh, which is very interesting. We share the campus with the College of Arts and Sciences, which has about 2,300 students in it. So altogether, Oberlin student body, about 2,800, 2,900 students. Uh, some of the things that really kind of define us as unique within the field uh, is that we have an undergraduate focus. Uh, that's very unusual for a conservatory of this caliber. A lot of times you'll see that institutions will have a large graduate component, uh, maybe a 60-40 split or even a 50-50 split between undergraduate and graduate, but we're about 95% undergraduate, so we're very heavily focused towards that. The College of Arts and Sciences is entirely undergraduate, so campus-wide, we're very much geared towards undergraduate education here, and that's pretty unique. Uh, sharing the campus with the College of Arts and Sciences is also kind of a unique thing to have a conservatory this caliber uh, on the same campus as a leading liberal arts college. So we utilize the college no matter what our students do here, which is somewhat unique in that conservatory students, even just as pursuing the Bachelor of Music, will still take about a quarter to a third of their courses in the College of Arts and Sciences. They can yield minors from the college. So we attract a lot of students that have academic interests as well as their musical interests, as you actually mentioned, Allison, and the double degree program, which allows students to obtain both a Bachelor of Music from the conservatory and a Bachelor of Arts from the college is a very strong part of our community here. About a third of the conservatory students here are pursuing degrees in both schools. So we attract a lot of students with a lot of varied interests, both within their art and then outside of their art, uh, which is really wonderful to be around. And then finally, I'll say um, that also, I mean, as Priscilla mentioned at Chapman, the community at Oberlin is something we find pretty unique. Um, and what's interesting is that it's in some ways unique in the same way. Music is a very competitive industry, but the students at Oberlin are very much collaborative. Um, one of the greatest examples of this I heard was a student that used to work for me who mentioned that Oberlin is the type of place where you're going to audition for the same role as your roommate. And when your roommate gets it, you're going to take him out to dinner because there's going to be some other opportunity come along. So it's just very much the vibe of the student body. And I think that that's some, in some ways a result of the fact that we're a residential campus, and that is kind of unique. So a lot of our peer institutions are in major city centers, um, but being outside of a major city, we're housed in a residential campus where students will live at least three of the four years they're here on campus. A lot of our faculty are tenure track, so the community is very strong. We all kind of live and work in steep uh, within that community. Yeah, I was telling Josh earlier, um, again, I live maybe 30 minutes from Oberlin. And it was one of my first visits when I joined Estrella. And I was on tour with a student from Houston, a student from San Francisco, Boston, and somewhere in upstate New York. And three out of those four student prospective students were visiting Oberlin because they were so excited about the opportunity to do the dual degree. I mean, it yeah, was like no, someone who was interested popular. in physics and cello and um statistics and music performance i mean it was just 
I was like, so that's what brought you here. And they're like, yeah, they, I mean, it's such a fantastic conservatory program, but I can do both. I don't have to choose one or the other, which, you know, I went to XYZ college and they said I could only do music or I could only do physics and I could do both here. So that's a very unique component because obviously they're very passionate about music, but they have varied interests as well. Yeah, it really is. And I, I find that um, as dedicated as musicians have to be to have a broader worldview can really impact the type of musician you are as well. So I, I personally love the fact that we share the campus with the college and there's so much ac access to academic curriculum. Um, just because even students that aren't doing double degree I've seen examples of students that have taken, there was one in particular, it was a, an electronic music composer that took a bunch of Japanese classes just because he could, which was quite interesting. And he ended up getting really interested in Japanese culture, did a winter term project over there, brought back a noise music group to do some master classes, and then he moved there. He really involved himself within the scene. And that wouldn't have happened if he didn't have access to something beyond just the conservatory viewpoint. Um, so it's a great, great asset to the students, really. And it seems to be something that a lot of students want now. They, they want the world around them to impact the art that they're making within music and, and other areas. So that's great. That is great. So what type of student are you looking for when, when we're thinking about Oberlin? Yeah, yeah. So what's interesting about this is there's definitely an, a, a type of student that's attracted to Oberlin, um, but I can't say that we're necessarily looking for that type of student, if that makes sense. So I guess what qualities of a student, I should have yeah, said that. Yeah, what so the, qualities are you looking for in a exactly, perspective? Exactly, exactly. So I, it's interesting, the qualities of the type of student that are attracted to Oberlin um, which we love, which is in some ways, um, you know, it's it's a conservatory of music. So everything's geared towards music. So musical curiosity is something that we see in a lot of our students. So they work within specific genres, but they have interests outside those genres, even beyond what we teach, or they have academic interests or curiosities. That's the type of student um, that tends to be attracted to us. But we're often asked the question, what are you looking for? Like, what's going to make me stand out in my audition? So the thing to know, of course, in music is that it's a performance art. And so the audition itself is what holds the most weight in our audition, in our application process. Um, it's really where we start our review process. And the faculty are very heavily involved in this process. So we have conversations uh, amongst the admissions team and the faculty within the area of study that the student is interested in to determine those admitted students. So the audition is very important and students will always ask, well, how can I stand out in my audition? What's really going to make them want me? And the, the reality is there is no magic. <laughs> There's no magic answer to this. There's no magical bullet that's going to get you uh, the nod. But what I will say that they're looking for is there is definitely a certain uh, level of technical expectation. And I say this because at Oberlin in particular, our ensembles are not tiered. So when students come in, they're placed in ensembles as underclassmen with upperclassmen. And the idea is we really put students in the middle of what's happening here from day one. And so there's an expectation that you can pull some weight within that. So of course, we're looking for students that can handle that type of expectation on them and how they show that through their audition is honestly being really comfortable in what they're doing. So what we're really looking for is somebody that's got a musical point of view. So they're, they're performing works that they're comfortable with, they're well rehearsed, and they've got something to say within that. Um, that's what the faculty are looking for. And, and that also leads me in some ways to a tip to any musicians that might be out there, which is to choose repertoire that's appropriate for you. Uh, the only way you're going to be able to be comfortable in an audition and get your point of view across is if you're not really worried about that upcoming phrase that you can't really quite do yet. Um, and that's okay. Uh, the faculty realize what your level is. And so perform things to your level, perform them well, make sure they're well rehearsed and, and have some comfort. And as Priscilla also said, have some fun with it so that they can see the person behind the instrument as well. That's what they're looking for. Someone with a point of view and a personality. That's that great. Helps. Thank you for those tips. That's wonderful. 
what would you say the timeline would be for these students? So like you mentioned an audition. So can you give us a little bit, like we're backtracking, what, what would the timeline be for someone who's looking to apply? Yeah, and a, a lot of what you said, Allison, really rings true here in this instance, because the the application and audition process for musicians, and, and I take it for all arts areas, it starts early and it lasts a long time. So the the application deadline for many schools of music and conservatories is December 1. That's a deadline that people should kind of burn into their minds because that's most of our application deadlines. Um, at least for a lot of the peer group of schools that you might be looking at if you're looking at, say, in Oberlin. Um, but it really starts prior to that December 1, because many schools, depending on the area of study that you're in, require a pre-screening round. And that could be unique for, I'm going to learn something here from my colleagues as well, because I only work within the realm of music, and I'm not sure if something like a pre-screening exists in other areas. So what will end up happening is students will submit an application on December 1, and they will also submit essentially a mini audition. They record what they intend to perform for their audition. Sometimes it's less than that, but it's dictated on our websites. They submit that as well, and they go through a first round review before they're actually granted a live audition. Um, and we call that pre-screening. So you'll want to start, I'd say, even in your junior year, the summer after junior year, very early in the senior year, looking at audition requirements so that you can prepare yourself to perform in the coming months, but also record yourself in preparation for submitting your applications by December 1. Once you pass the pre-screening round, then most of the auditions are happening in February and March. Um, and we yield decisions in March, and then you have till May 1. So it's a very long timeline. That's that's a really good point. And probably going back to what we discussed in like the previous part of this presentation is just making sure that, you know, how you're submitting that pre-screen is, like you had mentioned, comp something that you're confident with and something that um, you know, like really shows your true ability, but making sure again, too, that the, the lawnmower is not going in the background and you're not in some place that has terrible acoustics. So, you know, asking for a little bit of help with that from a music teacher or a professional or whoever gives you lessons that has some background in what would be an appropriate pre-screening video uh, yeah. or sound bite. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, we can, a lot of times students feel like they have to go have these professionally recorded, which isn't necessarily the case, but you do want to have an eye towards how you're presenting yourself within this. Um, so I think you kind of alluded or mentioned this earlier, you know, but we started getting following COVID, we started getting pre screening recordings of students in their pajamas hanging out in their house. And it's just not it's not a good look. <laughs> you know, So you should dress as if you're going to an audition. Um, dress presentable because that's the way they're seeing, that's the impression that you're making upon those faculty for the very first time. And you want that impression to be strong. Yeah, that's a great point. All right, so my last thing will be, can you give me one thing that you wish that the students that were interested in Oberlin's College and Conservatory um, or really the field of, of music would know um, before starting this process? Yeah, so, uh, I was thinking about this and really what I want to say to students, the one thing I wish they would do or know is to be prepared to make up their own minds about the institutions that they really want to study within. And, and I say that because there are a lot of influencers amongst, um, I'm going to say musicians in particular, because we have a, an art form that's often taught by someone specifically. So musicians will often be taking private lessons from a single specific person. And it's how our art is taught even in college. It's one of these master apprentice relationships where students are not only seeking out programs, but they're seeking out teachers and faculty specific uh, to their area of study to teach them. Um, so an example is say clarinet. There's one clarinet teacher at Oberlin he's the one person that teaches all the clarinetists their art. Um, so it's very important that there's that connection there. That starts in high school for a lot of our applicants where they're taking private lessons. And oftentimes those teachers will have a lot of opinions about the schools or the, the, uh, the college teachers that would be appropriate for them. Those are great opinions. Your peers will have opinions, um, but it's really important for you to go find 
a faculty member in a program that works well for you. Like you said, Allison, know thyself, right? Know the type of student that you are. Um, do you want, I'm going to send out some horrible stereotypes here, but do you want the Russian pianist that's really intense, like hey, bearing over you every week, expecting all this into your practice, or do you want someone that's a little more relaxed that can work with you um, at a level that's a little calmer? I, and that's horrible to say, really, but those pianists can be quite intense. Um, but, and that some students love that. They really love that, and they want to be pushed in that way, and some students want faculty members that uh, might feel a little bit more relaxed when they're dealing with them. So the idea here is use your resources and make up your own mind. And your resources are reach out to the faculty at institutions that you're interested in, reach out to the admissions team at the institutions because we can really help frame the programs for you, and connect with current students. I think the best thing any student can do is talk to students at the institution they're interested in going to um, because they will tell you the absolute raw truth about uh, about what's going on. For sure. Uh, I mean, I know it's not in the cards for everyone, but we really encourage our students at Estrella to make as many visits as possible because you can have that opportunity to meet with a professor, ask questions. And um, Priscilla, you had mentioned you were an athlete too, and I used to be a college athlete and a college coach. And we used to send our prospective student athletes with the team because that's where they, they got the T, you know, they were able to like really ask the questions about the program, about the coach, and probably the same thing about the instructor. You know, if they were, if you're their clarinetist and they get paired up, you know, for lunch with a sophomore at Oberlin that plays the clarinet, they can ask the real questions. Like, am I going to be a good fit here? Do I connect with the students? Can I see myself here? So again, I know it's not always, you know, something you can do, whether time or money to get onto a campus, but using your resources and connecting in that way. And now that everything can be accessible virtually, you could probably set up, you know, a 20 minute appointment over Zoom with someone. Yeah. And I was going to say that as well. It is, um, it is definitely a great thing to actually go experience a campus and a program for sure if you have the opportunity to do it. But the nice thing that came out of Zoom was now our faculty understand how to connect with students over Zoom. Obviously, we're running a lot of virtual programs at these places. Um, so again, that's a great way to do it. Yes, well, thank you so much. Very insightful. All right, last but certainly not least, I am going to move over here to Eric Castor, who is the Assistant Director of Admission for the College of Creative Studies out of Detroit, Michigan, but also a fellow Ohioan. So welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And uh, good to see everybody virtually uh, this evening anyway. Uh, yes. So tell so us a little, little bit more about, about your school and some unique property or qualities of your program. So um, we are College for Creative Studies, um, and we are located in Midtown Detroit. Uh, we were founded in 1906, so we've been teaching uh, the visual arts for over 118 years. So we've been around for a while. Uh, now, I'd mentioned the fact that we're in Detroit, and that's probably one of the biggest differentiators between us and many of our institutional peers, is we are very closely connected to creative industries. For example, did you know, that Detroit is the fourth largest advertising city in the country behind Chicago. Uh, oh, and guess what? We have advertising design. So you can see those connections being made uh, in a practical way. Uh, but I could make that argument for any one of our 12 undergraduate programs. So we have 12 visual arts programs. Um, we are an ACAD member school, uh, which is the Association for Independent Colleges of Art and Design. So just like Cleveland Institute of Art, Art Academy of Cincinnati, Columbus College of Art and Design, Pratt, Parsons, RISD, CalArts, we are that school, but in Detroit. Uh, and being in Detroit, uh, we have something called sponsored projects, which are opportunities for students to work uh, with industry within the classroom. Now, this isn't anything new. Schools have been doing this for, for quite a number of years. But, uh, you know, schools may have a one-off, uh, one a semester to a year. We have 17 sponsored projects a semester, which provides students in all majors an opportunity to work with companies within the classroom, where they bring real-world problems into the classroom uh, to uh, share with um, students, for example. Uh, I mentioned we're an advertising city. Mars agency has offices in Detroit, uh, not the Mars Candy, but their clients include uh, 
clients like Pepperidge Farms, and they worked with our students on a product placement piece for Pepperidge Farms Goldfish Crackers. So that was one example of a sponsored project. Uh, we also are what? Detroit Motor City. Uh, we have transportation design. We have one of the longest, oldest running transportation design majors in the country. So we've got companies like Ford and General Motors uh, working with our students on uh, uh, those sponsored projects. So that's that's another thing that is available to our students because we're in an urban hub. But even though Detroit is urban, it's not large, expensive, or inaccessible. It's it's very small by comparison of L.A. or New York, even I would argue Chicago. Uh, very easy to get around, and it's very arts centric. Uh, we have about 1,400 students, which is typical of most of those ACAD schools. Uh, we have a 10 to 1 student teacher ratio, so our students do get a lot of personalized attention. Uh, one of the things also that differentiates us is that we're a very student-centered program. Uh, we have a commitment to student success. Uh, we have a four-year plan uh, in place, in fact, of uh, students visit our website on the landing page for our career services department. Uh, you'll see where we have not just academic advisors, but faculty mentors and career coaches to help ensure students get from curriculum to career. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And I love that too about Detroit because um, being from the Cleveland area, I find there's just a lot of parallels. I mean, especially with just like the size of being a big city, but it is accessible and you don't have the, the insane cost of living. And um, there are like the trendy communities and the art scene and the food scene. So I feel like Detroit is definitely a fantastic place to go. And, you know, if you have those students that don't want to go to those major metropolitan areas, this is kind of a good go between for them. Um, so when you're looking at applications, what type of qualities are you looking um, for in potential students? So portfolios are required for all majors. Um, and the thing that we're looking for doesn't necessarily need to reflect the major that the student is applying to. So for example, student applying for transportation design doesn't have to have drawings of cars. Uh, if a student is applying to our fashion design program, they don't necessarily need to have fabricated garments. Um, we're looking for fundamental skills that really transcend all majors. Uh, for example, composition. Uh, an illustrator or a painter might be looking at a collection of objects or a landscape in front of them and trying to decide what is it that I'm going to capture of everything that's in front of me? From what perspective or point of view am I going to capture that subject matter? Well, wouldn't a photographer do very much the same thing? So composition, how do you fit things within the four corners of the frame of reference? Uh, we do have one major that is an exception to uh, the portfolio, and that is our concept design major. Uh, and concept design is not for animation, it is for live action film. So this is for students who are interested in um, helping everyone who's working on the film visualize what that universe or what that world looks like within the film. And we have uh, a good number of students apply, but only a quarter of those students are admitted. So it is the one program that has a deadline, which is February 1st. And it does require a very specialized portfolio. So students would, in that case, uh, need to cover um, categories of interiors, exteriors of dwellings, Vehicles, props, weapons, characters, costuming, flora and fauna. Uh, so it's a very detailed look, both traditional, traditional. Well, that's what we do, traditional and digital. We call it traditional. So um, they're doing both analog methods of rendering as well as digital methods. Okay. Um, all of our other programs, again, a very generalized portfolio, five to 12 pieces. Um, less is more, uh, in my belief. So it's not, oh, look, Eric, here's my watercolor, my pen and ink, my photography. You know, if you're not a watercolorist, um, it's not to say that you shouldn't experiment, but when it comes time to submit your portfolio, be very selective about the medium and techniques that you've mastered. Those are the ones that you want to uh, go to. And, you know, again, if you're not a watercolorist, I probably wouldn't put watercolor in your portfolio. Um, 
And basically we're looking at that and the GPA. So we're looking at a holistic approach. Uh, so uh, there is a minimum GPA and a conditional GPA, but I would say any student over 2.5 to a 3.5 um, it certainly is admissible. Uh, two to a two five is on a conditional basis, not a place you really want to be. But for students with a three five or higher, um, we're very generous with merit scholarship. So your scholarship is determined in part based on the strength of your portfolio and uh, your overall GPA. Okay. And you mentioned timeline for that particular major. Um, what is the timeline as far as just general applicants? So for everything else, we are on a rolling admissions, which simply means you could apply all the way up to the first day of classes and still be admitted, although I don't advise that. Um, so we do encourage students to submit their application um, as early as September of their senior year, um, even if they do not have the other admission requirements ready to go. By making application, it at least puts them in front of us. They're on our radar screen and we can more effectively work with them make notes and conversations that we might have throughout the application process. Um, we do encourage students to submit transcripts because we can make an admit decision on grades through the 11th year, so we don't have to have final transcripts to make an admit decision. And uh, the portfolio, we would encourage students to have things in by our December 1 early action deadline. That is not a hard deadline. Again, the only hard deadline is for concept design, which again is February 1st. February 1st also happens to be our priority deadline. Uh, so if students need more time to work on the portfolio, let's say they, they feel like December 1st is prohibitive, then perhaps they submit by the February 1st priority deadline. Uh, this gives them a little bit more time, but much beyond that, like I said, you could apply all the way up to the first day of classes. Um, completing by February allows us time to make the admit decision to get you packaged, to get your scholarship award out in the mail to you, to package your financial aid if you've completed the FAFSA, all in time for when we begin to open up registration for housing. I didn't mention we're a residential campus as well. Um, so that you don't miss out on opportunities. If there's a particular dorm, uh, for example, one of our dorms has kitchens. So naturally students gravitate to those and those go first. So if you wanted that particular dorm, you would want to complete by February 1st so that once we open housing registration, uh, you're going to be first in line to get your first pick. And you're also going to be first in line for scheduling when we open up registration for classes. Okay. So, I mean, it, like in most cases, well, I guess not most cases, but it's just good practice to be organized, be on top of it, be one of the first people to submit because it would help you financially, housing, and so on. So that's very good to know. And then lastly, what is one thing that you wish um, the students that were pursuing the visual arts knew before they applied? Just one thing? Just, yeah, <laughs> this is the one burning thing. Um, well, I you said it. I mean, attend National Portfolio Day so that you get feedback on the portfolio. I'm going to cheat here. I'm going to, because I'm going to keep my answers brief. I'm going to say, in addition to getting feedback on your portfolio at a National Portfolio Day, visit the campus. Because not only can you get feedback on your portfolio at that time, um, if you come during an open house, um, everyone you would want to connect with is going to be there. So you can tour your department, you can see the facilities, you can ask questions uh, and leave there fully informed. So if you're going to do anything and you're going to make a college visit, do try and do that around a open house. For us, we have them once almost every month on a Saturday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, one last thing that we do that I think is rather unique is if COVID taught us anything, uh, it forced a lot of schools to uh, do things uh, digitally, virtually. So we did a series of virtual departmental open houses we called Major Insights. Well, someone was smart uh, in the marketing department and, and they had the foresight to record these. So if you go to our YouTube channel and you type in CCS Major Insights, that's the magic word, you will find uh, 12 recordings for all of our undergraduate programs, which are deep dive into the program. So the department chairs talk about uh, 
you know, what they do in the classroom. So they lay out the curriculum, they show examples of student projects, they talk about internships, facilities, and where our graduates are working. That's great. I wrote that down. So then I can include that in the follow-up that we send out with the recording as well. So thank you for adding that. All right. I'll be try to be cognizant of everybody's time here. Thank you so much, everybody. That was great information. I loved, I feel like I learned a lot too about your specific institutions and programs. Um, I'm going to move it over to Q&A and then I'm going to actually stop screen sharing so then I can actually access the Q&A and see if we had any questions. Okay, Eric, this question was for you. Um, do you require standardized testing? We don't. We are test optional. Okay, That's so- short answer. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, I didn't really have any other questions here. So we must've covered it all. That must've been it. But this, I know you guys rocked it. Thank you so much um, for all of your insight and just for your collaboration. Again, it's, I think this is a great time because we do, you know, have a lot of sophomores that are starting to you know, generate interest in this and we want to keep them very informed. And I am appreciative that we were able to represent different areas geographically and sizes of schools and different application processes. So that was very, very cool. But Thank you all for your time. Um, if you have any questions, again, I will send out um, everybody's contact information with this recording. And um, we appreciate everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all right. You. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.